So, thank you for being here because um, I took my chance and we will be celebrating today the fifth anniversary. So, you know, it's good to make your anniversary like in front of the people. Well, actually, it's not precisely anniversary because it will be on 25th of May. Um, how do you sing happy birthday in Greek? Uh, okay, but no need to be singing that because it's for GDPR. <laughs> because almost precisely five years ago, the GDPR made it, uh, applicable. So GDPR, this acronym, enigmatic acronym, means General Data Protection Regulation. And it's something that, that I'm calling like a boogeyman for our developers. And unfortunately, it started five years ago and it spread it. So right now, in almost all parts of the world, there are a similar laws like California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, Canada has their own one, uh, there is even some specific about the child privacy. Even the countries that you wouldn't suspect that they care a lot about the privacy, they do, it seems. So looking even on the map, then it's clearly visible that this disease is spreading pretty quickly and almost all the world is uh, either trying to make their own uh, similar uh, regulations or uh, already apply them. So why do you need uh, and why do we need all of those regulations? Of course, bloody hackers, right? They are making everything bad. Um, so in case uh, for the younger people, there was a really great movie, you should watch it. <laughs> and uh, those hackers, of course, are, you know, destroying our software, stealing our data, breaking our favorite logging tooling, etc or even hacking and stealing the source codes, um, even like the, the authorization and uh, providers are harmed by that. But actually that's not correct or it's at best half of the truth because the real truth is that we are the bodies. Why? Because we, for a general years, when we get the questions, how many data do we want to store? Then we were saying everything. Yeah, like in the, in the movie, like give me everything. So we, are, we were not caring about the privacy. We, even if we are hearing the GDPR, then it's like, well, this is this annoying stuff when we need to finally be able to remove some of the data that users, those ugly users, want to remove, right? When actually it's not about uh, that, that because for, for many years we didn't care about that and uh, it was really not the great thing and finally those regulations had to come up to enforce all of those user rights on us and make us accountable for what we are doing. So the most known part of the GDPR is the right of erasure. And the right of erasure is also called like the law to be forgotten. So it's our user may came to us, like our company, and say that you need to remove all of the data and forget that I was, uh, I was a user. And that will be the topic of our talk. And I was even joking in the hall that this is a really great selection for the final talk because it's like politely saying, now you can go home because what can be sexy about the GDPR stuff? Actually, it appears that for event sourcing, it's quite interesting because in event sourcing, by the definition, our data is immutable. The, the biggest advertisement about the event sourcing is even I'm saying that on my talks is that you are not losing any data because you cannot remove it. So how can we remove it something if we cannot remove it something, yeah? Brainwash. So who's using event sourcing or was using? One, two, three, four, yes, thank you. And how many of you were using Kafka for that? Okay, then you need to re read a bit about that. 
but let's not spoil the fun. So even sourcing, in general, it's not about messaging. It's about getting the context and capturing all of the facts and all of the information, the business information that occurred in our system. In general, it's not so revolutionary. It's just a different type of storage. I mean, just. Because instead of keeping the current state and overriding it on each of the business operation, we are logging new facts, so events. So to be able to capture those business facts, we need to capture the exact business intention. So for example, we draw cash from ATM. And then in event sourcing, event stores, and that's what, that is my pun about the Kafka, because event stores are databases. They are app and only logs. So when you are reading the states, then your state is our events. So this is the name, event sourcing, because events are the source of true. So the first thing to do is to get the events, then apply them one by one, build your current state in memory, and then make a decision and store another event. So in event sourcing, shortly, we are storing all of the facts and all of the business information that our system and using those facts to make uh, next um, and to make next decision. And the trick is that most of the event stores are in implemented in a way that you can only append new event and that's all that you can do. So event store technically has two types of operation, append new event and read all events from the specific stream. And that's why I came here, because uh, I'm joking that I'm even sorcerer, but, uh, and you already know, probably noticed that I'm the lame joke person, uh, but I'm also the independent consultant, to quote like, like nicely, but in general, I'm trying to explain even sourcing to, to other people. And one disclaimer, as Googling doesn't make us uh, lawyers, even chat GPT doesn't make us lawyers, so I'm not a lawyer. If you, so whatever I told you uh, today, then you need to verify that with lawyer, with your chief security officer. And if you don't have chief security officer, then you should probably have such one. So let's go to the rate of erasure. And before we go to the event sourcing part, let's discuss how it is implemented typically. So there is a one intention probably, we, if we are good enough, then we are adding some um, like a UI for that where a user might say, just please erase my data. I don't want to be a user of your system. Plus, I don't want you to even store those information that you, 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 you knew about me. And so typically when we are getting that request, then we are trying to delete that from all the tables that we have in all the tables that we have those informations. So like a user's information, emails, addresses, application logs. And the other way of implementing the right of erasure is anonymizing data. Because the important part about the law to be forgotten or the, the right of erasure is that we don't need to remove all the data. We just need to remove the data that will be, that will make us um, somehow deduct from them what, what was the exact person. So for example, the, the tricky part is that if we have like a room, like a class, like an IT class, where there is a single woman, hopefully not, but let's assume that it is, then this information might be good, it might be already a GDPR information because based on this fact that we knew who was studying on that class and that there was only a single woman, then this fact allows us to find who the person was. So it's tricky. And so anonymization looks like that, that we can take just, uh, you know, the generic, inform the, the precise information and we can make it generic. So as I said, typically, uh, like we can leave information like gender, etc., but we need to always do it case by case and understand our data. So this, this is one of the things that why I tell that uh, we are the baddies because, you know, it's boring, like who would like to 
think about the data we are storing and writing, right? Um, and you saw already those application logs, and application logs never ever put any PII, so personal information in logs. That's just pathology. Just don't do that. Just don't do that because it makes life easy, ha much, much heavier. Because application logs works in a similar way like event sourcing because they are up and only. We are just appending new events. So, it seems that it's all good because we can find those tables, say that, okay, when we get this request, then even if we have like 10 tables, then okay, we will write some SQL scripts and remove it. But what about backups? Like, the things are getting much, much more complicated when we think about backups. And as we know, there are two types of people, those that are doing backups and those that will be doing backups. <laughs> and, <laughs> And if we are in one of the group, then eventually we might realize that even if we remove the data or even anonymize the data and we uh, restore the backup, then we immediately got again this data that we just removed. So how to deal with that? So typically uh, the, the case is that we, we should store the information about like the user intent to remove in some other database and have another backups. But of course, what if we store those um, intentions in the same backup as we store our application data? So this is one of the important aspects also about the, in general, about the GDPR that we should really start to be caring about what we are storing, where do our, when we are storing. So, as I mentioned, the, the most obvious choice is to, to break it down as user constants, requests, restrictions, keep it in the other database, maybe even different type of database, and break it down with the application data. But GDPR, if we were just saying that GDPR is about removing data, then we would be um, like extremely simplifying this because GDPR, oh, let's try it again. Yeah, not works. I try to turn it off and on. Okay, so user rights are not only about the erasure, so we should be caring about much more stuff. So giving people the chance to be informed so what we are doing and how we are keeping the data. We should be able them to edit those information also the restrict what we are doing with the data, like for example, not only restrict the part and the functionalities, but also like user could say that, okay, you can use this information in general in your system, but not for automatic decision-making, like, uh, um, like for example, the, the loans, et cetera. And of course, the, we should be allowing user to Tell that, okay, you can do with our data whatever you need, but do not send it to anyone else. And actually, in GDPR terms, we are not telling about users because, you know, those, everything was written by lawyers, and <laughs> we are the bodies, and uh, lawyers, you know, yesterday uh, there was that we are saying about the employees as a resources, and in GDPR we are telling about users as data subjects and data subjects are our consumers and users. And this information, this slide is pretty important because it's about uh, who should be caring about what. So we, our company and us, our, our project is a data controller and we are responsible what we are doing with the data. And data processor like a storage service or any other cloud service is data processor and they should not be caring what they are doing with data. The only thing that they should be doing is just making sure that whatever you do is safe enough. So they are following the best security practices. But if we are our developer, we are in the middle. And as always, if you are in the middle, then you are in the, the worst position, right? So user rights. Let's talk about the, some other rights that 
the, the law to be forgotten, the right to be informed. And as I mentioned, we need to tell the user precisely what data we are storing and what we are doing with it. And if we have like those four tables that you see on the screen, then we can say, yeah, no worries. We will just make some registry. We will write the documentation and we will precisely know what we are doing with our data. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to put everything on this slide because there is another one. So <laughs> those are examples of uh, the PII information that you should probably not be keeping if you don't need to be keeping them. And if you spread, and usually it's not like we are just keeping this information, like what we are believing, this is our data, right? We are putting that neatly in the, the, the shelves and we know where it is, but actually our data usually works like that. So if we didn't try and didn't thought about what we are doing with the data, then after after we implemented our system, then finding out where is the PII data is like, would be like, where is Wally, right? So this, some may say that piece, this is a piece of cake. Some may say that it's all good. I would say that it's pretty complicated and we just discussed two rights of, that we should be following. So that, that was me when I was preparing this initial <laughs> uh, initial way how to deal with that. But let's go finally to event source system and make it even harder, right? Because that's what we are here for. So can we remove the data? I already said that in event source system in theory, we should not be removing data. But as always, we can. Like there is no impossible things in software development, right? For miracles, we just need to wait one week longer or two sprints. So question, uh, does anyone recognize this picture? Yeah, what it is? <laughs> yeah, so this is precisely the, the old screen from, I think, Windows XP, something like that where we didn't have this SSD disk and the life was much different. But why am, why am I showing that to you? It's like on the disk, especially those magnetic disks, when you were removing some data, then you had those empty spaces that in theory, they, are, they were empty so you could put the data there. But um, as the disk was spinning around and it was making uh, our system much, much slower, and there was a process called defragmentation of the disk in Windows, where the Windows would just take and sort it out. So keep all of the, the, the used data together, so move it from one place to another. And in a really similar way, even stores, and in general, even uh, source systems, can, can deal with that. Because even though you, most of them do not give us explicitly functionality like delete this event, delete this event, or modify that event, then most of them give us the chance to mark that, hey, I won't need this set of events. So for example, I won't need all those events that happened before some certain date or in actually position. And in event store DB, which is the, the first event store that was made, this functionality is called truncate before. So we are saying that if we, if we tell that to database, then we say that from now on, when you will be doing some cleanup, then you are free to remove this, this events. But the removing is not actually removing because this process, what is calling in event store DB scavenging, what it does, it just takes the files because you know it's database so it's everything is on files and it creates new files based on them and the old files are immutable so they are not changed if you are doing any audit legal stuff etc this won't be touched but the the new files that you just created or this automating automated process just created they will be uh, 
filtered and not having those information that we marked as to be deleted. So it's a trick, but it works. <laughs> and Kafka does the same. So there are Kafka users here, as I saw. So even though Kafka is not an uh, event store, <laughs> it is not really. Um, then Kafka, in a, from the logical standpoint, and in general, even driven tooling, can also use this, the same pattern because Kafka has a process that is named log compaction. And what it does is more or less what I described with the scavenging process or the fragmentation. So it just, uh, you can mark that you don't need, like in Kafka, it is the retention policy. So you can say that you should be keeping all of those messages for two weeks, two months, whatever. And um, this process take care of making and shrinking our storage. But the, the files that can be created, then they don't need to remove. They don't need to update the currently existing files. And this is also the part of the things that we are generally should be doing with our data, but we are not. Even if we are not using event source system, then we should be thinking about the data in terms of whether they are hot, cold, or warm. What I mean by that? So we already learned in last years that it's fine to break our data model for the write model and read model to be able to somehow transform what we wrote into the new interpretation. And that's only one part of the transformations that we should be doing with our data. Because by hot data, I mean the transactional data. So all the data, all of the information that we need to make our decision. And remember, in event sourcing, we are making decisions based on events. In our regular systems, we are making based on rows, documents, etc. And this is the same strategy that we should be applying. So if the data is cold, so we are not using that at all, then we don't need to keep it in our transactional database. And archive process doesn't mean that we are removing data. It's like we are moving it to somewhere else. And we might need some different strategies arrive about archiving our data. So archive may mean that we have some audit obligation that we should be keep, keeping our data for like 10 years or five years or whatever. And this, this is also a trick with GDPR because in some regulated industries, you cannot remove data. Like you cannot remove the patient information because it needs to be kept. So GDPR doesn't mean that you never ever uh, cannot uh, keep the data. If there are other laws that tells that are more important than to keep the data, then you should be keeping them. But maybe somewhere else. Like if you need this audit, then why do you need to pollute this, your database? And remember the fragmentation? It was about making your disk faster. And that's also for our regular databases. If we keep junk and trash in our database, just because, just in case we need it in, in the next few years, disclaimer, you won't need it, then um, why to keep it? So we can move it into some blob storage. We can just... If we, if we have some warm data, which means that we won't be modifying that, but we will be just needing for querying or some um, analytics, then maybe just put it in your analytics database, but do not keep it in your right database. Do not keep those junks. Or you can just keep the same type of database that you are using, but with the lower, um, like with the smaller instance size, etc., and pay less for that. So, and then after you move those information, so after you, you, you took those, for example, even in our event source case, when you took them and archived them, so put it somewhere else, then you can actually drop it, right? And use the techniques that I show you before. And what I told you right now just covered the case of the 
systems and modules that we are in control. But nowadays, hey, most of the talks that I saw <laughs> were about Kubernetes or Quarkus, etc. So we are living in a microservice world that we created and we do not own all of our data. And we should actually, because we, will, we should be searching for which module is the source of truth for the data. But of course, we are not doing that every time. So when we are showing, sharing this information, like publishing uh, data to our other modules, or even if we are exposing this information um, through the UI, then we are already losing control about that because we might be, you know, those serious and those um, smart guys that will be always caring about the privacy and doing all of the best practices. But who says that other, our colleagues or our other systems that we are sharing data will be responsible as, as we are, because we are, of course. Then how to deal with that? So the potential solution for that is so-called forgettable payload. It's not like 100% uh, sure technique, but something that at least will make us easier to manage what is happening with our data. So when we are sending some message, some event, and informing other systems about the change that we made in our module, then instead of sending this whole um, PII information, so name, organization, birthday, hobbies, etc. What we could do is we could just replace it with the field that is named personal data and send the link where someone can query and access this information. So of course, when they query it, they can also cache it, etc. So that's why I said that it's not 100% sure tactic, but at least um, we are saying explicitly that we are in the control and that can already create some uh, mind scratching exercise for the users that they will already see that we took the effort to somehow limit the access to our personal data and the this this is like a forgettable payload because when user says that um, they would like to remove the information then we can remove it from our database, even from the event source using these techniques that I mentioned. So, um, so the scavenging and log compaction. Then if the user tries to access, then we can either re return information that this is not applicable anymore or return a null or whatever we prefer or anonymize data. So we are in the control about that. And so this is already quite, uh, quite nice. It gives us some tooling, but it's not only what we should be doing with our data. So as I mentioned, the, 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 we should be able to inform user what we are doing with the data, but unfortunately, we, we, can't, we shouldn't be doing vendor locking and we should give them the chance to be able to take, take the data out and, um, and use even our competition. So if we are mingling the data together, then of course that won't work well. So best thing is to spread the PAI data and the application data. So we can do it in a multiple ways of course, keeping user contents in one more database. So we can keep it in different databases, different schemas, different tables in the classical approach. And in even driven, we can do a similar stuff. So we can use different clusters, different topics or categories, or we can use different streams. So for example, prefixing our streams with some information that will allow us to, uh, to find which one we should be uh, keeping more care about. So the, the thing that I would like to ask you, do not put PAI information into topics names, into partition names, into uh, stream names, because in many systems you just cannot remove it. 
Like in even StoryDB, this will stay forever. You can tombstone stream, which would mean that you cannot use it anymore, but this information will stay. So don't do that. Hash this information if you really need to. But I think that even looking on your faces, that, that seems like, okay, so he's saying that this is not so hard, but he already is speaking like half an hour or so. And yeah, you're, you might be right because that's, that's pretty a lot. But there is one more technique that could make that thing a bit easier. And this technique is called crypto shredding. And of course, it's like a blockchain, but made with the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. <laughs> no, just joking, no blockchain. Crypto is from the cryptography, so the original name. So this is the diagram and we will go step by step with it. So this is yet another take on how to make the life a bit easier and how to remove something without removing it. So it's yet another trick that I'm showing you, but this is quite neat technique. So instead of when we need to keep like the PAI information in our events. Let's say that we already applied some of the patterns that I mentioned, like we, we keep them in the separate uh, categories or topics or stream names, etc. And we keep the PAI information there. Then instead of just putting the raw information, what we could do is we could encrypt this information. And if we define encryption key per user, then every every stream that is um, related to the specific user will use this uh, user encryption key. And that's also important why I told, show you the previous uh, uh, slides about the portability and splitting the information because if we put information about many users in the same streams, then, then we are making our life a pure misery. And technically, what we can do to make this automated is that we could define, like, this is, sorry, I've, I know that most of you are Java developers, probably, so this is like my humble C-sharp code, but you can do precisely the same with the Java using annotations. So you can def mark your contract. You can do the same if you are using protobuf with some custom attributes. So you can mark which field contains information about the user ID, right? So for example, customer ID. And we can also have another attribute or annotation marking which fields of, the, of, the, of our contract contains PII information. And once we have it, then we can use this customer ID and take the value from this contract and use it to find the encryption key that we store in some secure uh, key management store. Like it can be HashiCorp Vault, any cloud provider has like uh, AWS has KMS, Azure has, uh, um, uh, has Vault, Google I think it's also called KMS. So we are taking the value from the contract, from the ID, and then we are encrypting it. So it's a quite similar technique like for the forgettable payload, but it's more neat because if someone doesn't have access to this uh, encryption key, then they won't be able to decrypt that. And that's also the trick for when user wants to remove the data because we are not removing data. They are still in our database. What we are doing is just we are removing the encryption key. Right? So if we want to decrypt the information, then as I said, we are taking the attribute, taking the value about the customer ID, getting the certificate, and decrypting the personal data. So the other way around. And when user wants to remove it, then they just remove the encryption key. And from now on, we are not able anymore to decrypt it, even though it's staying in our database, and of course, we should apply all other techniques that I mentioned before, but it's like quick deal. And if we, we can apply this technique for any other type of database, like Postgres has the PG Crypto plugin, um, the MongoDB, etc. for sure you can just uh, write your serializer, etc. 
So this is really simple technique, but it gives a lot of options. So what about backups? And in the backups, it's even simpler because even if our data that we should be removing in backups is there, then we don't need to care about that because it's already encrypted, right? So if we deleted the encryption key, then we already deleted the data from the backups. And in the classical approach, I don't know even how to do it. You would need to restore the backups, clean up them, create another backups with cleaned up data. So this crypto shredding technique is much, much easier. And for the external system, or then, you know, we should in general not be sharing too much with external systems to not be buddies, but um, we can also give them grant the access to our certificate store. And if they have the, if they lose, if we remove it, then they won't be able to, to decrypt it. So it's also easier. And there is one thing, and I'm glad that Dan yesterday about his talk in the quantum computing didn't break my talk, uh, because it said that when the quantum computing will came or just the, our encryption key will be busted, then someone can get into our backups and get this information from our backups and decrypt it because let's say that RSA was probably broken a few times. So, of course, we should use really the most secure cryptographic algorithm that we can. And we should also be using all the other techniques that I mentioned. So we should have some retention policy. We should not be keeping the data that we don't need, etc. So in general, be a good body, right? So crypto shredding is not like it's a totally bulletproof solution, but I think that it's the simplest option that you could apply, not only in event source system, in general, event driven, but also other data databases. And my take on GDPR is that it's a privacy framework. It's not something that is bad. I think that actually it's good that we got those regulations and we got those suggestions how to work with our data. Because what I told you is, you, 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 I think that you already noticed, it's not that most of the information are not specific for even sourcing. It's in general about having the transparency of what we are doing, uh, empathy to our users and building the credibility and trust. So applying the data government's practices that we should be applying, but we were not. So it's all about the user rights. So in the end, are we the bodies? Probably, but we don't need to. So I hope that after the talk, you at least have some tools how to work with that. And even if you don't apply them, then sure, you will need to at some point. Uh, so even if it's not 100% sure, then maybe it will help you to not go to jail. <laughs> there were already such cases. Of course, developer was the blame to blame. And in general, that's all. Thank you a lot for being there and standing with me. And if you scan this QR code, then you will have more resources also from people smarter than me and the, the version of the webinar so you could share with your friends and make your, uh, your friends also like good buddies, right? Not buddies, like uh, bad guys. And one last thing. Uh, I'll be staying in Athens till Wednesday, and on Tuesday I'll be at the DDD Greece meetup. So if you'd like to join me, then feel welcome. Uh, I think that we will have the chance to discuss some other facts and myths. And yeah, thank you all. Awesome. Thank you very much, Oscar. Do we have any questions for Oscar before we let him go? We have one here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you gave the example of gender um, not being 
PII, but sometimes can be PII. Uh, if it, uh, and other examples, I think in one of your slides, some data could be PII if mm -hmm. cor could be correlated. So are we responsible for, um, how, how far is our responsibility to know um, all the possibilities of what mm -hmm. could be used to correlate. So, you know, if I have like a table with all the employees in my company and they're like, uh, and I have a gender column, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if there is a, uh, I don't know, another system that has the information on a subset of users that are like 99% male. Mm -hmm. How do, how do, how do we do that? How do we deal with that? And how far do we have to investigate this mm -hmm. before we can become baddies? you know uh, so we don't become bad <laughs> okay um so the first rule is uh, you should ask yourself do you really need to store this data and if the answer is no then do not store them that's the the first like the filter that you should apply the next filter is that when it appears that you need to store it then um, make it contextual so um, in a sense that currently it's we got to the position where we see that normalizing our data is not always the best choice, right? Because if we normalize, then we are keeping, like we are spreading the information in the sense of normalizing in the sense of relational databases. So if we denormalizing data, then that gives us a chance to, for example, say that in this context, you will keep the information about that process and maybe in this part of the process, is, it's not like a GDPR information that you keep the gender. But in this context, in this business process, it definitely is. And where to get those information? So as I mentioned, that's, that's something that I think that each uh, major organization should have. So should have a person or a group of people that are responsible for shaping out the general standards how we are interpreting uh, our in our domain in our system the the data governments and in, in my opinion that's also something that we, we always should have at least the general practices how to deal with the data in our project and uh, what tactics strategies we will need to apply it doesn't have to be like we we need to all of apply them uh, immediately but maybe if we reach this phase then this is this is like a tool that we use that that's why i'm calling gdpr a privacy framework because in the specific aspects of processing data you you can look on this specific parts but um, the, my best recommendation is to always have someone that is really like you know lawyer or privacy specialist not someone like me <laughs> going on conferences and tell, telling you how to do your uh, job. But yeah, jokes aside, I think that um, we should be really caring about the data governments processes. And that's what I would su suggest. Great. Any more questions? No? Okay, then. So, um, last announcement is that Nokia at Nokia's booth, they're having a gift live lottery. So as you leave, don't forget to go past them. Also, as you're leaving the building, make sure to give a high five to all the amazing uh, organizers and volunteers. 